Welcome to Impact Investing, brought to you by the Supporters Fund. From the crispy, creamy, and sweet pastas de nata, a secret 19th century recipe, capital of the world, Lisbon, Portugal. I'm your host, Jeffrey J.P. Podvin, and let's please welcome Lawrence Yen from Taipei, with the tallest green building in the world, the Taipei 101. Welcome, Lawrence. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, JP. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here today. Well, I'm excited to have you today, Lawrence, on the, on the pod, because what excites me about this is that you're living in Taipei, but you've also lived in China and a few other countries, and including brought up in Canada. So there's so much crossover in your world and global travels, but also in the impact investing that you're making, that it gets me really excited to be able to dive in and learn a bit more about yourself. And the way that we love to start off our show is that we want you to give us a bit of a background all the way from your BC to your University of Toronto days, and then one thing about you that nobody would know. Yeah, thank you, JP. So, uh, so I was born in Taiwan, and uh, I moved to Vancouver when I was 11 in 91, and um, spoke a little bit of English, and uh, basically uh, took myself all the way through to college in Toronto, and uh, I, I'm, today still I'm a Raptors fan, I'm a Maple Leafs fan, and I still root for the Blue Jays. So uh, those years really changed me in, in those ways, and um you know, after I graduated from college, um, I wanted to come back to Asia because uh, that was 2004. Um, that was the time when Shanghai was bustling. So I actually took a trip to Shanghai uh, in 2004. And, uh, you know, at, at a dinner, dinner table, there were folks from, you know, uh, Germany, from Spain, from uh, U.S., of course, Canada, Argentina, all over the world in their 20s. And uh, just looking for something new. And it just totally felt like a land of opportunity. So that was when I decided to kind of move from Canada back to Asia and uh, put myself in Shanghai back then. Um, then I got into banking, of course. That was, uh, I, I took the finance route um, in U of T and um, did that for a few years before I uh, wanted to try the route of um, you know, running a business. So in 2010, uh, a very good friend of mine from LA went back to Taiwan and uh, he wanted to start this beverage business. And uh, it was something very similar to Red Bull uh, back then, an energy drink. It was uh, really picking up back, back then. So um, we went back to Taipei and uh, we started a brand new uh, beverage brand from, uh, from scratch. So uh, we tasted all kinds of energy drink off the shelf, and we found our own formula. We went to OEMs and uh, did the entire pr uh, process ourselves from manufacturing to um, uh, retail channels to uh, branding and promotions and everything. Uh, so that was my first startup experience. And then um, after a couple of years, uh, the company steadied. And a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to help her with uh, the venture capital that she's running. And uh, that's how I got into venture capital. And uh, since then, I guess, uh, that was 2012, uh, I co-founded four businesses. Um, one of them failed. Uh, I tried to do e-commerce in China. That didn't work out very well. Way too competitive. Um, I did the beverage company with a friend of mine. We also did a... Um, uh, I, I did two food and beverage company, one of them in China, which uh, grew from a zero stores from PPT in 2018 till today. There are uh, 2000 franchisees across China. So that did it quite well. And uh, another uh, ready to drink cocktail company I also co-founded that went uh, series B. So a lot of it in the consumer segment uh, with my startups um, and also through my venture capital days. I was looking at very generic uh, subjects, so from software to hardware to um, uh, retail to consumer, et cetera. But then by 2019, I started focusing into the area of climate just because, uh, you know, I, I thought, uh, A, it's bound to be something, unfortunately, that's going to get more attention as 
time progresses in the next 10 years or so. And uh, plus, you know, it appears to be that uh, um, a lot of the technology in uh, climate technology is related to hardware, which is something that, um, you know, me coming from Taiwan is, is pretty good at. Uh, you know, Taiwan makes a bunch of stuff. So uh, in 2019, end of and beginning of 2020, I, uh, I got a bunch of my friends together and, uh, you know, these guys, they are, uh, they may be running family businesses or running family offices. And, uh, you know, I sat them down and said, hey, guys, listen, um, you know, you're all in a variety of industries in, uh, in hardware, in traditional manufacturing, in tech manufacturing. And um, listen, the world is going to become more sustainable in our consumption, whether you like it or not. So, uh, you know, for you guys in textile, in footwear, in cement, in steel, in glass, um, you know, the guys who really haven't uh, had to innovate in the past 40 years, I'm like, hey, uh, you know, these ought to change in the next 10 years because um, we're going to have things like carbon credit. We're going to have things like energy, uh, energy consumption measurements. So why don't we take our know-how in our manufacturing, in our industries, and uh, you know, raise our hands and say we could be a part of the solution um, when the world is trying to become more sustainable. So uh, early 2020, right before COVID, uh, we started a small fund together. And uh, this is where I'm today, you know, the, the MIH Capital Fund, where we are investing into uh, climate tech and sustainability technology across the world. Um, and our mission is really to uh, try to connect Asia with global technologies. And uh, our, our thesis is that, um, you know, in the US and Canada, in Europe, um, you know, there are great scientists, great technologies, great institutions um, for the best minds to um, excel and, and uh, to really go beyond uh, their capabilities. But then like, I also realized that for a lot of these technologies in uh, uh, climate technology or sustainability, whether we're talking about energy or talking about material or talking about food and agriculture, most of these are hardware businesses, meaning that unlike software, where um, you get a bunch of engineers together, uh, you write a script, an algorithm, you launch on a website, and then you advertise on Google or Facebook, and off you go. Um, when it comes down to hardware, uh, it's people say it's hard business. It's not because the te technology is hard. Of course, the technology is hard. But the tough part is that there are so many incumbents in place. So you have to talk to upstream suppliers, uh, downstream customers, and uh, the whole ecosystem is so complicated that uh, for a newcomer, it, it's always so taxing on their time, on their um, mind space. So what we're trying to do from Taiwan is, hey, since we have all the industries available uh, within a four block, four block radius, essentially, um, we make... Uh, a bulk of the footwear is that we, we're wearing, uh, T-shirts, shirts, jeans, um, uh, software, uh, data centers, all kinds of stuff. Um, since we make all this already, since we are incumbents in the industry already, why don't we take our know-how and try to help startup to get into these uh, segments and make their lives easier? So, uh, so yeah, we're trying to use our, our network in Taiwan um, you know, with these family businesses, these incumbents, and say, hey, if we could uh, A, invest into new technologies and B, help these technologies incorporate themselves into the supply chain, maybe, you know, we could help them accelerate their go-to-market timing by a year or two years. And uh, if that's the case, I think that would be a blessing to everyone in the climate space because uh, we need to uh, make sure all these awesome technologies are in the market uh, as soon as possible, as fast as possible, um, you know, for us to uh, really have a chance right now. So uh, is that story too long for you? No, that was perfect. Uh, that was a, that was a great share. And, and I'm going to kind of unpack some of this so that we can dive into a few of these things that you talked about. And, uh, but before we do one thing about you that nobody would know. I am uh, I am like yourself. I am a total introvert. Um, I hate it going on stage. I hate talking to people. I love my corner. But somehow here I am today talking to you. I guess uh, two introverts together on a conversation.
I love it. Well, th that means that we're going to, one, we spend a lot of time looking and watching the world. And then two, we have a million opinions. We just don't share them enough. So in this case, I guess we get to share them uh, quite a bit because we get to bounce them back and forth. So I love it. So I right on, right on. all the way back to uh, kind of, well, you know, you, you spent some time in Toronto. So you've got this really good landscape idea of um, kind of the ecosystem that's going on in Canada as well. Yeah. China. And I know when we were chatting last time, it, you mentioned something that was really kind of cool to me. Um, and I've never heard this from other investors before or from really anybody is that you said, I have a place in China because China is innovating so quickly that I need to be able to go there and spend some time just so that I can keep track of everything that's going on so that I can figure out how to bring that back to mainland where I'm going to be working in, in the investor space. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because to me, I just, that's the only thing I could keep out of my head. I was like, man, that's so cool. Not too many people would say, I need to be in this center all the time because the innovation is happening so quickly and I need to stay up with it. And China has always been looked at as this kind of taking IP and not really benefiting the rest of the world. And in your terms, you're saying, no way, man, China is on fire. They're building, they're growing, they're in a yeah. second of the day. And when you go there, you get to learn more about what they're doing and how much more advanced they are than the rest of the world. Can you share a little bit more about that experience and why that China's uh, in such a fast moving environment? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, back in September, I went to New York for a climate week and uh, it was great. A lot of uh, conferences, a lot of discussions about, you know, where the world is going, the Fortune 500s, there were startups, uh, investors, uh, all sorts. But one thing I felt that was missing uh, was a, of course, presence from a lot of the Chinese representatives, and two, there weren't even a lot of Asian representatives. So you don't see a lot of uh, folks from Japan, from South Korea, uh, Hong Kong. Um, so to me, I think you're really missing a big part of the um, puzzle here by not having these guys uh, on stage. So uh, on China, you know, the reason why I wanted to be in Shanghai, I was actually in Shanghai uh, throughout COVID. Um, for better or worse. Um, but the reason for that is, uh, you know, today media is so robust in Europe and U.S. and Canada that we could know what's happening in U.S. and Canada and Europe, wherever we are, right? There are the 10 crunches, uh, tech crunch, fast companies. Um, you could get all the information you like about these areas. But uh, nobody really knows what's happening in China, Right. People assume they know, you know, um, from what they hear from the Western media. But uh, the reality is, you know, even by being in Shanghai, I still have very little idea what's happening around the rest of the places in China because it's such a. It, it, when we have 1.4 billion people working on something, uh, something's working, and something you're not aware of is being worked on. So that's the fun part of it. And. Um, so by being here, you get to hear and have the pulse on the ground and to really understand what they are working on and, um, you know, the areas that they're really focusing at. Uh, for example, you know, just on a random uh, a WeChat message, uh, kind of like the Facebook for, for WeChat, I was just kind of scrolling. And then uh, this friend of mine, he, uh, he was sharing on uh, a hydrogen economy, basically. You know, it's a VC from Beijing. And they had the startup camp. They had this whole industrial park basically set up for the whole hydrogen industry. So U.S. has seven hubs, right? Seven hydrogen hubs that have startups, investors. But when China does it, they just put it on steroid, right? When they want to do autonomous driving, they would take out this brand new city and just make sure that it's being tested and done in that particular city. Um, you know, people are talking about uh, different materials. How about, let, let me tell you the story about one of the investments I made back in 2013 uh, as, a, as an example. So uh, with my previous firm, uh, one of the deals we did was in a battery material uh, company. And back then uh, in 2013, uh, EV was happening, but EV was not happening. Uh, recall back then Tesla was making enough cars and then they were not making enough cars. So people were still kind of skeptical whether or not Tesla will become a thing or not. Of course, today looking back, of course it's gonna be a thing, right? It, match, it, it, it checks every boxes uh, on our score sheet. Um, but in 2013, that wasn't the case. 
But then in China, we're hearing noise about Shenzhen wanting to switch their entire taxi fleet to electric vehicle. Back then, it was unthinkable, right? There were, there were not enough charging stations. There were not enough infrastructure. Uh, we did not know if these cars are well built enough, right? Will they catch fire? All of these were uncertainties and question marks, uh, but they made it happen. They made it happen. They made BYD happen. BYD became the largest battery manufacturer in the world. Um, Buffett invested, and then uh, everything else was public story uh, from that point onwards. But it's just fascinating how a combination between government incentive, um, between the central government, the municipal government, and the startups themselves uh, can't really work the magic. Uh, that's not to take away anything from the entrepreneurs, because uh, I remember on, from an interview Munger did that the founder of BYD was a genius. Like he built stuff and they work relentlessly. Like there are no, uh, I'm not sure if you heard of the term of uh, 996, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, people in China, they work from nine in the morning to nine in the evening for six days a week. And uh, so if you combine all these ingredients, ingredients together, um, it, it really shouldn't be a surprise where uh, there used to be a, a player who copies technology from different places. Uh, now they could be leaders in, in different areas. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think, uh, like you said, for me, it's a really fascinating to really understand, uh, to kind of be in the black box, because to me, China is like the black box inf of information. You don't really get much uh, outside of China, but by being inside of it, um, I get to know uh, what they're working on. And when I do, uh, when I assess my investments, I get to take more of a global perspective because uh, today, if you're sitting on a climate conference or in a tech conference, um, if you're excluding China and India, that's not global. <laughs> that's, that's two of the largest populations you'll ever find in the world. And uh, if you're talking about climate problems, uh, it's not going to get solved without uh, China and India on the table. So, uh, so anyway, again, uh, a short story long, but uh, this is the reason why I, I, I really enjoy kind of being in multiple places to understand where all the technologies are going for for these different players, I love it, and uh, and I think that the nine nine six is pretty much adaptable across Asia. Uh, I know it's pretty strong in Japan as well. They they do a, a lot of a very similar uh, setup when it comes to um, operational and working. So I, I think that uh, it, it carries through well. It's, uh, I'm not sure North America has picked up on that, other than uh, they probably dislike it. But I, I think if you want to make a quick bounce into a market and you want to learn it be the best at it you do have to put that time into it and the you know as much as we maybe grudgingly want to accept that hard work hard work is what pays off in the end and you know it, it doesn't matter uh, how much you get paid or any of those things when it first starts it's how much effort you put in how many things you're going to learn to meet and then the money will eventually come so it, it's kind of fascinating that they call it the 996 i've never actually heard the term but i'm Pretty familiar with it globally. Um, and yeah. It's interesting, like when you started to, to kind of share, and I, and I think if we go back to even when you started your energy drink company, um, I, I think that, you know, with the way everything that's going on in China, and I've always felt the same, China's a bit of a black box. You don't know what's going on. But today they're advancing technologies a lot faster. And perhaps to your point early on, maybe years back, 10, 20 years ago, there was some IP um, learning, taking and utilizing. And today... Yep. They're advanced in a lot of these areas because of what they've built. You know, the whole world looked at China as being the offset for uh, reduced labor costs, functionality, getting it the product to market. And I think that that was a huge advancement on behalf of China that, you know, they said, hey, we can do this. We'll keep everything at these regulated costs. And now what we're going to do is we're going to be advancing faster than you because you put all your tech in our space. You wanted us to come up with a clever way to build all of this stuff for for minimal cost. So we've made you all money. And now today we're going to be a global power because of it. And I think you're seeing a lot of that happen in the in the global uh, geopolitical world is that this is all coming to uh, a bigger position for China. Um, but when you started your first company, you know, you went into the energy drink side and you were competing against, as you said, the Red Bulls of the world. And you went into operations manufacturing, maybe used a bit of China to build this. 
Um, I just remember at that same time you were talking about that, uh, some buddies and I were looking at being distributors of Red Bull and thinking, could we do this in Canada before it actually was in Canada? Unfortunately, we chose that we didn't have the right um, uh, abilities to do that. And long and behold, it's become kind of the energy drink to go to across. Right. But when you went through the experience that you did and you said you found the formulations, you built that, are there three or four things that really stood out to you today on what you accomplished during that journey that you could share that really will help others understand what it takes to be that entrepreneur? Absolutely. Um, there, there's nothing that can prepare you uh, to, to start a company. Absolutely nothing. You have no idea what's ever going to hit you. Don't, so the best way to start a business is to start a business. Uh, no textbook is going to prepare you for that. Um, uh, nothing is. So, yeah, I, I think it really taught me how difficult it is to start a business and how fragile it could be. It's not that it, people always paint a beautiful picture when they talk about finding a company, um, but it, it's so rough. And I recall uh, hearing Jensen Huang in an interview, right, talking about he would never start a business uh, if he was to do it again. Um, similarly, but I, I think uh, thinking back, it was tough. It was a lot of, you know, slap in the faces. Um, but uh, we don't regret it because had we not gone through that journey, uh, all of the companies that comes after that would be even more difficult. Because I think every step you take, every mistake you make, uh, only make you more resilient and that experience, uh, you, you can't learn it anywhere. It, it, it really is true that once you get in there in the thick of things, you know, you, I saw this um, Sam Altman um, discussion where he's talking about starting a company and what he learned. And it, it's interesting that the whole time it was your whole existence is solving problems. Every day you're being thrown more problems, people problems, yeah. this problem, that problem, and you're always trying to fix them to move forward. And I think to your point is that if you didn't start, and the whole idea is just get out there and start, start something. Yeah. And when you did do that, you got the learning that allowed you to cut out four more businesses. That. And I, I think that that's pretty exciting and pretty phenomenal because a lot of people, like you said, may not have ever decided to go back and continue to build a company. It was too much work or uh, too much hassle. I, I'm going to guess you kind of created a template that said, Here's the types of things that we're going to do. This is how we can tackle these problems. And if we do this, this, and this, and maybe you can list what those four things are that really helped you build the next four companies that allowed you to be able to go through and do them. Maybe a lot easier. Maybe it was different people, uh, different focus, but whatever those things are, I think they're that template to what you're doing today, which is the venture side. It's similar venture side where you're going out and finding techs that you want to invest in so that you can enable them and cut back one to two years off their growth pattern because you can help them through all of that because of what you guys built before. So maybe you can share a bit more about what those cookie cutter things are that are really important. I know everybody, I'll throw one out there. Everybody always says team, but you know, team is tough when there's no money. So you can't go and hire the right. PhD a uh, coder when, you know, they are costing uh, 800,000 and they're going to have to steal them from open AI. So how did you work through those and, and maybe give a couple of hints on what really makes a, a great business to move it forward and how you did it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot where I heard it from, but um, uh, it really made a lot of sense to me is that, um, you know, of course, all that journey uh, really let me understand how difficult it is. And um, uh, what someone said was, uh, when you're just starting uh, in, to invest, you try to look for the rule. But then uh, once you kind of get out of the woods or once you start you know, getting your feet wet, you start to look for the exception. And um, so before people would look for a particular model to look at, to go after when they invest. Uh, but now I tend to look for the differentiator. Like, uh, you know, uh, ABC is uh, pretty general. You know, this could be uh, uh, copied or this could be caught up very, fairly quickly. But this particular team has a particular asset that just cannot be replicated. 
whether it is their experience, whether it is their birth experience, uh, the, the, the childhood uh, experience that they had when they were raised. It could be education, it could be a mentality, something there that's different uh, that could not be copied. The, the product can be copied, the technology can be copied, um, but it might be the resilience. It may be that they have the network and nobody could copy. Um, so uh, going back, I think instead of looking for the rule or that person who kind of matches, uh, you know, the next Zuckerberg, the next Bezos, the next uh, Altman, you try to find the uh, exception. Try to find somebody who is different than who's out there right now. And, uh, and then with our experiences, we try to fill the gap, right? Because especially when you're in, you're in early investment, uh, no company is perfect. Like nobody's going to check all the boxes. Um, but as long as we understand that, A, they have a particular asset that could excel and B, the rest of the things that we could uh, build a solid um, you know, advisor group or um, solid investor on cap table to fill in the gaps, uh, I think that gives it a better chance of uh, winning out at the end of the day. No, I love that. And finding the gap or filling the gaps, I guess, and, and being resilient and networks and different. It really comes down to being able to, one, understand what they're trying to solve and what they're doing, and then what makes them exceptional over everybody else that's in the same field. Is there something that's, there's something that's going to make them? I've probably talked to this a few times on the podcast, but um, one of them was um, uh, flow water, flow hydration. You know, when they first came out, everybody just said, oh, another water company. But the difference for me when I saw them and, and – um, made an investment into them feels like it was almost nine, 10 years ago was that the water company, their differentiator that was made them completely pop out of nowhere was the fact that they were branding. They were building a brand health and wellness brand that didn't exist. So they were going above and beyond to show and prove that there was something bigger and more out there than just water. Yeah. 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 Went into the, completely green space, trying to figure out Tetra Pak doing something different. So the differentiators were there and everything else, but it was all about the style of branding and how they were appealing to a large segment of people and users. So I guess in the same instance is that it doesn't have to be the differentiator. doesn't have to be always the product or the team. It could be the branding. It could be, there's a lot of elements, but what makes them stand out of everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Recall I mentioned uh, the, uh, the battery material I invested in back in uh, 2013. The founder, well, the CEO of the company uh, was born in China, but then he went to Toronto for, uh, for, uh, but the story was when he bought a one-way ticket from China to Toronto, and then the first thing he did after the plane landed was to be on the street selling flowers because that's how he could make and pay his tuition and, and his rent. So he was literally like a PhD student selling flowers on the side of the street. And uh, I think that builds character, that builds resi resilience. And uh, in comparison, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of monkey wrench thrown at you when you're running a business uh, start uh, mattering a lot less when you kind of went through that to become who you are today. So. I agree with that. I, I think what's um, the, the winning side to that is that when you are faced with the realities and survival is the only way to go, that you'll do whatever it takes. And if yeah. you have a passion that's really strong for what you're trying to build, you're going to do whatever it takes to get that off the ground. And, and I, I'm sure there's a, a lot of great stories out there of founders that started off and did everything they could to push something. Um, like the lady that wrote, um, oh my God, what's the famous uh, like eight movies on uh, sorcery, witches. Oh my God, why am I having a... Uh, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. So same idea with her was right down to the wire. Like the last, you win the game, you win the award. Um, was right down to the wire, right? And she was like, I, I'm on my last straw. I don't know if this is going to work. And then found someone that believed in her. So uh, I completely agree with you that you have to do whatever it takes to, to survive. And especially yeah. if you believe passionately about something that you're good at or that you're going to build that's going to change the world. You kind of have to stay and stick behind it as, as much as you can. Yep this moving forward it there's some other cool things that i want to kind of unpack and when you started to move and shift and decided back during the covid time that you wanted to go into more of this climate tech green space mm -hmm. you started to make that change over 
and you've already made investments that were in the sustainable uh, space. Right. What kind of gave you that drive or decision to say, I want to get behind this. This is where I want to be. This is where uh, I think we're going to see the most impact and change in the world. What was that kind of turning point for you that, that kind of stepped you into that new direction? Well, A, because um, uh, I think for better or worse, um, it, it's it's a good business decision because uh, whether we like it or not, uh, the climate problem is not going to be solved in the next 10 or 20 years. So if that's the case, there's always going to be innovations. There's always going to be uh, problem solvers trying to make things better in that front. And the demand is going to be there. So that's uh, for better or worse. But B, you know, uh, I think this is where my experiences and our uh, partners' uh, businesses can really come and play and be a driving factor. I think uh, personally, I, I, I try not to be a pure financial investor um, or a boardroom investor, but not to say that they don't create any value, um, but maybe because of my background uh, coming from having co-founded four businesses that I, I like to, you know, be involved in the business and see how we could help drive it. Uh, because if we can do that, A, we, we understand the business better and B, uh, our investment risk get reduced drastically as well because, you know, we're partially in control. Like we know how far we could help take, take this company forward as well. And so I have the confidence that, you know, with our uh, incumbent industries in Taiwan, that we can help so many of these startups build their businesses out, whether it is through sales, through supply chain, streamlining. Um, and if we, could do, if we could do that for for these companies, I think it's a win, win, win for everyone involved. So uh, uh, B, that's where our value could be created. And C, if we could, uh, if the icing on the cake is uh, for the world to be better, you know, what better business is there? So, uh, so I, I really enjoy doing this. I enjoy talking to people about this. And I'm pretty sure this is not something that's going to become a bubble, so to speak, because I, I think whatever progress we could make uh, with these technologies, it's only going to be better for the business and for the world. So uh, there are no complaints. I like that. And it, it kind of reminds me of when people were coming out with green-based products. You know, at the beginning, there was a lot of greenwashing products that said right, right. sustainable and natural, and 90% of them were just labels and all kind of fake. Yep. Looked at it then and said the same thing that you just said now is that it's an industry that was going to keep growing and it wasn't going to go away. It wasn't just a bubble. It wasn't something that was fly by night. It's something that the world needed to change and it's starting to do that. Move away from chemicals, move away from uh, plastics and everything else that have been going on. So to your point is that this climate tech or green tech these spaces are something that we may look at as, oh, this is just nice to have. It's it's irrelevant. But I think when you do and read all the, the information that's out there is that the world does need to change and that this is going to be something that's only going to grow and get bigger and stronger. And it's not going to be something that's going to bubble burst and become uh, everybody's going to go back to the way things were. It, it is a progress in the uh, growth of humanity. So I do agree 100% with that. And, and I think it's amazing that you've taken this trajectory. To get into a couple of questions, because I think in this space, there's so many terms that get thrown around. So I'd love for you to kind of share a couple of uh, details around these terms. And then the, the questions I'll kind of dive into a little bit. But so there's a lot around um, sustainability. How is sustainability actually going to be sustainable? And, and maybe you can share a little bit on this. I think that there's a lot of that greenwashing that's that people are getting frustrated by right. that they're sustainable or they're ESG based, all of these things, they all throw out the terms, the acronyms, but really at the end of the day, is there something that you define and say, this is the better way to look at this. Uh, this is what's going to bring sustainability to this market. Yeah. I, I was talking to a, um, a founder I invested in and uh, he said something that was very interesting. And I think, most people will not realize is that, um, you know, what most people believe to be uh, kind of decoupling from, from petroleum, uh, all we have to do is to drive a Tesla or a e vehicle, uh, 
and the world will be okay. But um, fundamentally, you know, our entire material and chemistry industry has been built upon petroleum. So if we have to decouple from petroleum, uh, then we actually have to start from the scratch. So from ground zero, we have to build all of our particles um, differently. So whether it is through a bio-based molecule, whether it is from a, a bio-based material or captured CO2, um, we have to completely revamp that because you know, we have to stop digging carbon out of the ground. I think that's something very clear to us already. And uh, only if we could reconfigure all of our uh, consumption from the first particle onwards, I, I don't think we can be sustainable uh, in that way. So that's one part of the equation. Another is, um, you know, how do we make sure that whatever we throw away uh, really gets reused again? So, um, you know, been talking to a few battery recyclers as well, right? Today, why are we digging up more lithium, more cobalt, more manganese from the ground when these are available? When we are throwing available lithium, cobalt, manganese, putting it into uh, landfills, you know, having these pollute our soil, um, why can't we recycle these instead of mining more of these materials out of the ground? So I think all of these are technologies where we could try to make it more circular, in, whether it is from a feedstock basis or from material basis. Um, and only technology can uh, can make this happen, I think. Kind of like the leap from uh, a Nokia and Motorola to iPhones. If we could make that kind of a leap uh, in these technologies, then uh, absolutely, I think we will uh, uh, we will be able to have a circular economy where um, we'll find equilibrium in our environment and our consumption all over again. I love that. And I totally agree. And I think it was something that the petroleum industry did intentionally, which was find ways to use petroleum to become the sticky part of everything that's being developed. And I think the trajectory started in the 60s when everything started to become petroleum based from how you make uh, products to your homes, to everything across the board. So it made it so sticky that everything had to be used that way. And today it's now trying to re-engineer that process and saying, how can we build better products that don't have to use all of these types of resources and, you know, to your point about Tesla and everything else, even in the battery space, you know, it's the manufacturing that goes on in the background that creates just as much uh, offset or uh, right. problems in the environment. Um, but the perceived value is that these are solving the world's problems, but they don't look at what's being created in the background. And I think in that circular economy, to your, to your point, is that how do you close this environment off in a circular way and reutilize everything in that environment to build a real value for the population? Uh, so they're getting something out, but they're reusing everything that they take so that, that we're not stuck yeah. with sort of outside waste and we're not stuck with products that get disposed of and take centuries to break down, whatever that might be. And, you know, I found it interesting that um, about uh, maybe it's a week back, I um, was listening to a few different podcasts and they started to actually break down um, a lot of this uh, rhetoric that's been around saying plastic bags are bad, straws are bad, the breakdown takes this. And they actually dove into this. And they said, you know, this was all done by organizations trying to create value for themselves, that they created these false narratives so that people would get fearful of it, block it. But when they broke it down, they actually said, no, the plastic bag breaks down uh, in, you know, 30 days. And this was made up. It was never this 10,000 years and all of the trash that was found in the animals that was just placed there and done for photo shoots. And everybody just wanted to falsely believe this. But what they didn't understand is that they had to do this in order to create an urgency, which created new markets. But at the same time, what I think it also did is it started to allow people to innovate and say, wait a second, there's something better we can do with this. So as may, they may have been trying to save their industry, but what they did is they sprouted up a thousand more businesses that were a right, right. problem and actually find a better way so that you couldn't go and try and create all this false narratives around the storylines that they were trying to create and actually crush those businesses that were doing that because they were finding better ways to create that circular economy and create better products that were sustainable. Yeah, a absolutely. So people always get really surprised when, uh, you know, when, when I tell them that, uh, you know, most people know that your 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 cars use gasoline and petroleum. Less people know that your plastic bottles are made from petroleum, 
Even less people know about the fact that their nylons come from petroleum. And even less people know about the fact that their shampoos and detergent come from, from petroleum. So I, I think people always get surprised about you know how ubiquitous the, the, the material is. And uh, going back to your point, um, we really have to um, find the technology that could help us decouple ourselves from these you know, fossil fuel, these fossil carbon that's been buried underground for millions of years, um, you know, which could eventually uh, really hurt our climate if, uh, if we don't do something about it. Agreed. Well, the last thing yeah. we're gonna, I'm going to ask before we dive into our 60-second rant is in the impact side, you're starting to see a lot more businesses today than ever before coming up with that closed circle loop where they're reusing everything that they're building. Is there a way that allows for companies today than your vision and what you've seen in China and around where companies are able to start off at a hundred percent, say renewable when they start their business, or is it always going to be that they're trying to get to this hundred percent circular economy, uh, economy in their business? Is there any businesses that you've seen that from day one, they were able to start off right away and make sure that they kind of closed looped everything? The truth is, I, I don't think the technology is available and ready for that to happen today. Uh, just to give an example, um, a friend of mine, they're trying to make a material uh, that's target, targeting to be businesses, but that could replace all the plastic packaging material uh, in the B2B businesses. So today we're seeing problems in, of course, plastic bags or Amazon packages. That's a problem everyone sees and, and labels and targets. Um, but nobody sees um, the plastic being used in a supply chain, right? Today you're, you're shipping a produce from farm to your table, right? How much plastic it is used in between. You're shipping, uh, it could be semiconductor manufacturing, all the plastic trays you're using, et cetera. Um, all of these uh, they may actually add up to more than the consumer packaging that we're seeing on the ground, but people just don't see it. And if they don't see it, they don't recognize it, and they don't account for that into the equations. So um, I think by today's technology, it's going to be very hard because it's just everywhere. Um, but uh, what's really comforting is that there are people from different angles, different trades uh, working on these solutions so give it three to five years. I think you'll see a lot of these companies coming out of stealth and really providing a solution at price parity, which is also a critical point because I think a lot of these are available, but they're not at scale, not at price parity. If that's not the case, then it's never going to fly. So um, I think in three to five years, um, uh, what you just said earlier about can a company start at 100% sustainable, uh, I think that can happen in... Uh, just give it five years to be safe. Um, but I think we'll have the technology ready for that. I think that's great. And, and it's a good projection because I do uh, agree that there's, you know, when you start off, do your best to get to that, but also have a roadmap on how you can get to a hundred percent. And yeah. actually in time, just like when the internet started to build a website, cost you a hundred thousand or a million dollars to build, they were eventually able to get to these to cookie cutter as well. And that took maybe 20 years. So this is working at a lot faster speed. So there's a potential that you can start building products in a faster, um, higher volume way. And to the biggest point that you shared there is that at par, like they're competitive, they're making money. Yeah. And I think the last part to this solution, and I think you talked about this in one of your other podcasts, which was people have to be able to generate revenue and generate a value that's going to allow them to pay the, for all of this and cover those costs. I think that right. makes it very sustainable, but it also proves that I can build a company that is 100% closed loop circular, and it allows for all the businesses to be able to recruit and make the money they need in order to grow this business and be sustainable and be impactful and spread their technology around the world. And those things are all come from the innovation to your point is what's getting built over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. I love it. All right, we're going to change into the rapid fire. So this, All right, let's do it. You have 60 seconds. I'm going to hit the timer. I will throw my hand up when you've got five seconds left. Uh, typically, I never do that because the rant's too good, so I end up letting it go for a little bit longer. But um, 
I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that. And then I'll throw in one rebuttal, but the idea is just anything that drives you crazy about anything. And then I'm going to try and have some sort of rebuttal to help you. Uh, and then you close it off. Ready to roll? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. You're good to go. Start. Yeah. I, I think uh, very similar to what we were just discussing today in our conversation is um, I ought to think Asia needs to be a part of the puzzle in the global solution and climate uh, just because, uh, you know, uh, people in clean tech 1.0 complained and cursed out China because they were undercutting prices, they had government subsidies and all these stuff, um, basically uh, allowing the U.S. companies to uh, for debt, basically. And uh, my argument for that is, uh, yeah, because they were competitive and their government was working together. And if it wasn't for China, we will never have the renewable energy source we have today. That will never happen. We will have the price, uh, the cost of a solar panel maybe three times to five times uh, it is today. And we will never have the uh, power generation uh, and the cost wise to, to, to even give us a chance to make sure that things are renewable. Um, so today, but whether it is um, you know U.S., Southeast Asia, Canada, Mexico, Europe, Eastern Europe, anywhere, if they could give us the best solution at the best prices, we can build off that. Because to solve the uh, climate crisis, it takes everyone, and uh, you know we need every solution uh, on hand at the cheapest price possible for it to go mainstream and uh, commercialize. So that's my rant. I love it. Now. Everybody's going to fight back against this and say that uh, China just produces so much product that is subpar. It's not worth it. They're just junking up the space all so that they can be in there and be competitive. But at the end of the day, they're forcing innovation. They're forcing change. They're making you look at China as a competitor, regardless of how you look at it. From Dubai to Canada, you name it, they're competing. They're flooding the market with products, good or bad. How do you get them on board? I sat in a debate with um, China versus US and it was uh, Bannon versus, uh, I can't remember the other gentleman's name. And they went at it pretty good about China's global power and how they're changing the way people uh, see everything and how businesses interact. And I 100% think that China needs to be at the table. I'm supposed to be going against your rant, by the way, but I'm also supporting it. That China needs to be at the table. How do you get them there? Because at the end, well, everybody looks at them as being the bad guy. And I think they're actually the ones that are making this level playing field, which keeps everybody competitive. Because if not, everybody doesn't care to be competitive. They just want to pay the largest dollar. So how do you get them at the table? Because it's important. Well, let me, let me add to your point before this. Uh, that being, you know, China was the cheapest player in, in the early 2000s. But looking at the labor structure now, they will not be the cheapest player today. So, you know, how do we get uh, India? How do we get Southeast Asia? How do we get other countries? How do we automate the processes? How do we uh, get people to work harder even, right? The 996 perhaps to kind of work tirelessly around the clock to solve these problems, right? Because... Uh, realistically, the more break people take, the more idle the machines are, um, that's, that's cost, right? So at some point, I keep drilling in uh, to some of my portfolio uh, in that, you know, like, listen, every penny saved on rent, on, you know, labor cost, every bag of chips saved in your canteen, that goes to your cost. So by being mindful of the cost, um, that's the best part of it that could kind of uh, allow your margin to grow, allow the prices to come down and to allow the market size to grow. So it's no longer, uh, China is no longer the cheapest player in the world today, but you know, uh, now who's going to be the next player? Who's going to flood the market with these new products? Uh, for me, as long as it gives us the best chance to solve the climate problems, I can invest into India. I can invest into Southeast Asia, into Mexico, South America, that's fine, um, as long as the problem gets solved. But if we're too caught up with, you know, uh, is this going to take market share away from the U.S. or Canada? Uh, then my suggestion would be, listen, guys, you know, get with it. You know, you got to work harder or find a place to work with, a couple and work with Mexico, right? How do we? Uh, how does U.S. and Canada work with Mexico to make sure that your production costs come down, right? 
um, because I, I really believe that uh, it is so critical to the well-being of our civilization that for these technologies to be at cost where people could really purchase and use and um, commercialize at a massive scale. So that's to add to your point uh, before this, but how to get China to the table. Um, I, I think they are at the table, whether you like it or not. Right. It, it, it's a matter of, you know, how do we find a position where everyone could win out of the equation? I don't think, you know, the the Western countries have brilliant innovation. And there are a lot of very hardworking people as well. Um, but sometimes I, 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 I feel like, uh, for example, Mexico is a great place to partner right now. So if we could combine um, all the brain trusts in North America and Europe and really work with uh, Mexico, the South American countries, work with, Eastern European countries. I'm actually very bullish on Mexico. Um, you know, I actually have a lot of friends from Taiwan setting up facilities in Mexico uh, just to supply the supply chain in the North American region. But I, I absolutely believe that there is a way to make sure that cost is competitive with China. And it's going to be a very kind of a, a friendly competition going forward because people are going to be so desperate trying to find the lowest cost and best, best technology that the only people who benefits will be consumers and human beings uh, altogether. Well said, well said. Well, I'll, I'll only add in that I will 150% back you on the Mexico piece that since COVID um, and because of China shutting down and the regulations they created, yep. Mexico has been booming. Uh, their GDP has been growing at like three and a half percent quarter yep. uh, since this occurred. There's more manufacturing. Some of our portfolio companies started running their manufacturing out of, out of Mexico. And really, you're solving problems. And, you know, the same thing in Kenya. Uh, Google dumped, um, I think it was 500 million or 50, yeah, 500 million into Kenya to create jobs for the same perspective of how do we fix this problem and, and uh, allow resourcing to be more effective. Uh, how do we retool some of the people that are in these different regions? And I think this has to happen into a lot of countries. You know, Egypt has been yeah. built on the fact that 82% of their population is in the manufacturing tool uh, services business. And the reason they're doing that and they haven't moved out of it is because it is a more cost-effective labor and they have to be able to compete against the rest of the world. They haven't been able to upgrade that resource like Canada, where 90% of us are in management services, et cetera, um, you know, that was built back in the 60s. So that document that was written, it said this is where Canada needs to be in order to be a global power. Well, the same thing has to happen in these other countries. Unfortunately, you're going to have countries that are coming out of, uh, you know, impoverished circumstance and or they don't have the resources that they need um, in the ground to pull out. So they're going to have to find ways. And sometimes it comes through strength, mind and resource, and they're going to use those to pull yeah. from. So I think Mexico is a great example of having a little bit of everything and being able to adapt to the market and be able to help move products around globally through their shipping lanes. Um, and yeah. everything else. So I, I think it's um, well spotted there. And I do see a lot of uh, continued upside that's happening in Mexico. Very bullish. If they can take over as the lowest uh, cost denominator, I'll be very happy about that as well. For sure. Agreed. All right. We're going to move into our next segment, which is rapid fire questions. So uh, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to, well, I'll ask one. You choose as an investor, which one you find to be the best suited for you as an investor. Got it. All right. Here we go. First question, founder or co-founder? A co-founder. Unicorn or a four-year 10x exit? Four-year 10x. Tech or CPG? Uh, tech, tech, tech. NFT or Web 3.0? Uh, Web 3.0. AI or blockchain? Uh, AI, AI. First time founder or second, third time founder? The second, third time founder for sure. First money in or series A? Uh, 
Uh, series A. Board seat or observer? Board seat. Safe or convertible note? A convertible note. Lead or follow? Uh, for now, follow. Favorite part of investing? Uh, the people. The people. The learning experiences. Number of companies invested per year? Uh, about six to eight. Beautiful. Uh, verticals of focus? Um, climate and sustainability. Two qualities for a startup to stand out. A clear differentiation and hustle and execution. Toughest lesson. So generic. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, no. It's so, so generic, but uh, just got to put it in there. Nope, I love it. Toughest lesson you've learned as an investor. Nothing is ever as expected. Fair, fair. What is something that you would share advice wise that you give nine out of 10 times to startup founders? Things are never as good as it seems and never as bad as it seems. Find your lane. Love it. Do you have a philosophy or rules that you stand behind? In investing? Yes. Again, they really have to have a differentiating quality. It's got to be different. Okay. Who is your hero or mentor and why? Uh, my dad. My dad, he taught me everything. He uh, is uh, in business and philanthropy. Uh, that, that is a three hour conversation. I love it. Well, that's good. What is the most important technology that you see changing the world over the next five to 10 years? Well, hoping for fusion. If fusion happens, well, it, it's, it may have a prototype in five to 10 years, uh, but not commercial. But then if it happens, it will solve a lot of our problems. I love it. What line do you find you share to investors over and over? Depends on where they are, actually. I, I wear different hats. If I talk to uh, guy people from, uh, you know, U.S. and Canada, and then people from uh, from Asia, so uh, I, I guess uh, um, see the world, if anything. You know, make sure you know what everyone else is doing. Fair. What is your favorite investment? Um, the, the one in battery material because uh, it got me into energy it did really well uh, the market cap went 200x so uh, you know how can I not love it fair what is your worst investment and you don't have to say names well I or experience even the ones that well, how about this? Uh, one of them actually, uh, or I, I can't say the one that the if the business failed, uh, fair and square, then there's no complaint. But I think the ones that are fraudulent, you know, you you really learn from that there are signals about uh, the founders that you didn't catch. I think those are the ones that, uh, I, I, I'm sure that's on everyone's. Uh, most regretless right now, uh, especially today, right? So, agreed. It's happening more and more these days. So I guess yeah, base ends up getting hit with it. So, don't get on the Forbes cover. <laughs> yeah, avoid Forbes. Agreed. Yeah. All right, we're gonna jump into the personal uh, questions now. One or the other. Um, most famous person that pops in your mind. Man, that, that is a. Right now or historically? Any, any name that pops in your mind. Man, you caught me. Uh, 
I, I guess uh, Munger, because I just uh, read his uh, read his uh, biography. So perfect, and he's a good person to read. Uh, first person that pops into your first brand, sorry, that pops in your mind. As of now, Apple. I'm looking at an Apple right now. So, pardon me. Book or movie? A movie, movie. Superman or Batman? Uh, Batman. Fortune cookie or birthday cake? A uh, fortune cookie. Less calories. <laughs> Five minutes with Bezos or Oprah? Uh, can I say neither? Yeah, of course, of course. Mountain or beach? Beach, beach. Bike or run? Uh, run. Big Mac or Chicken McNuggets? Oh, Big Mac for sure. Trophy or money? You could take the money and buy a trophy. How's that? All right, done. Beer or wine? Oh, wine. TED Talk or book reading? Um, TED Talk. TikTok or Instagram? Newsletters. All right. Facebook or LinkedIn? I try to do more LinkedIn than Facebook, but uh, struggling with that too. So, okay. Favorite movie and what character would you play? Favorite movie. Well, since we talked about Batman, of course, The Dark Knight was amazing. And uh, favorite character. I actually like Alfred a lot. All right, fair. I, like I thought he was such a, his, yeah. He is, he's a very calm demeanor to him. Very strategic. Yeah. Favorite book? Recently, uh, uh, Speed and Scale. I've been sharing that a lot with, uh, with the guys in, the, in, uh, in investments. Speed and scale. Noted. Uh, favorite sports team? Uh, Toronto Raptors. Nice. The same. They're awesome, too. I agree. They, well, they, they're doing okay. They, they've had some better years. Yeah. But they're getting there. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough conversation. What is the it's a grind. best to you? Uh, if I could, it's my mantra. Basically, if I could just make things a little bit better around me. And uh, if I could do that, then, uh, then that's everything. I love it. What's your superpower? Listening and being an introvert. I love it. It's a great skill to have. I think you're also uh, very good at um, the, the global perspective. And I think that carries a lot of weight as well. Well, Lawrence, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us today and all of your time. It's been a real pleasure having the opportunity to be able to deep dive in your background and talk about everything impact. And the way we like to kind of end our show is we want to give you the last word to share anything back uh, to investors or to founders. Um, and also, if you can share how people can get a hold of you, that would be awesome. But I appreciate all of your time and thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, JP. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think you put on the show notes. And uh, if there's any way to share, um, just basically try to make the world a little better for people around you, for things around you, um, you know, with your work. Yeah, then uh, if everyone does that, then the world is a better place. I love it. Well said. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Which you Thank you, JP. Thanks for all your time. Thank you. We'll speak soon. Well, it was a, it was a great conversation uh, to chat with Lawrence and dive into pretty much everything around you know, climate tech and impact investing in, in China, Mexico. There was a lot of great sound bites there that we're going to pick up on. And, and I think that, you know, something that really does make a big difference uh, in the conversation, especially today versus, you know, over the last five, 10 years, is that there is a big global change in where manufacturing and production is actually being done. 
And, you know, to Lawrence's point that you don't have to look for this value and decide, you know, does China need to be that global power? Can you start to shift everything into Mexico? And, you know, do they have the right shipping lanes, the right value that you're going to get what you need to in order to build your product to move it forward? Um, You know, and the other thing that I really thought uh, caught everybody's attention, especially mine in this, was that, you know, look for that differentiator. We can just invest in another company, but what is the real differentiator that makes things better and different? Is it the founder? Is it the product? Is it the team? What is that differentiator that really makes that business zing versus everywhere else? Um, and I think the the last thing that I would kind of dive into is, you know, when you're qualifying the model, the business, and you're looking for those gaps, you know, figure out, is this something that you can scale and you can build into a great company. It's going to be tough no matter how well you organize yourself and the greatest teams and everything you've put together, you're going to find a tough go no matter how you skin the cat. So just like his first company versus his three others, you know, there's always going to be troubles that you're going to be working through and you're always trying to solve problems inside of the problem that you're solving globally for your business. You know, that's how business works. That's how it is. And there's probably a great formula I mean, if you do have questions or you want to dive into that more, I I employ you to reach out to to Lawrence. Um, He's a great plethora of information, especially if your business fits into the climate tech uh, space. So outside of that, I want to thank you, everybody, for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please feel free to share with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or please follow us on Spotify and or Apple. Uh, Feel free to share an audio or video clip around the show, and we may include it in one of our future podcasts. If you can find us on social platforms, take a look on LinkedIn at Supporters Fund and any support or comments you have are truly appreciated. helps us improve the show. Please visit us at supportersfund.com or startup events at openpeoplenetwork.com. Thank you and have a fantastic day.